Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hang Out with CERN. We're back here today, and we're going to talk to you about talent. You might not realize it, but CERN has talent, and the LAC has talent. This is Mara, and she definitely has talent. She's one of my physicists working with me on the Atlas experiment, and a, a uh, what is your role, actually, with talent? Well, I'm the deputy project coordinator. Deputy project coordinator, exactly. okay. So I have helped set it up. I'm now running the project. Very good, very good. Okay, so we're going to hear more from Mar about the project in general. And we also have with us several fellows. We have three fellows, to be exact. Uh, Raphael, Laura, and Arno, who are going to be joining us from the LHC and the universe, as you can see behind their backs there. They're over in the CERN outreach meeting room. And they're going to tell us what it's like to be a Mary Curie fellow working on a project at CERN that's called Helm. Uh, before we get to that, as usual, we have a few uh, things to bring up. News flash. And I guess I'm only going to bring up one, right? Okay, I'm just checking with my producer here. We have one news flash this week. Uh, it was announced on the 12th of June that the International Linear Collider has published its technical design report. You might not know exactly what that is, but it's essentially a blueprint. Uh, we don't know exactly where the location is going to be, but it's going to be perhaps the next big thing after the LHC. It will take many years to construct this, but people have been thinking about how to do that for a long time now. Uh, as you know, in high energy physics, we always go from big to bigger uh, to look smaller. I know it sounds tricky, but you have to do that. You have to have a lot of energy to probe inside of the universe. And oh, here it is. Oh, already? Look at this. Just off the press, there it is, the technical design report. Okay, thank you very much. Wow, that's incredible. If you don't mind, I'm going to read this for a little <laughs> bit. I'll, I'll wait. I'll read it afterwards. Um, it, it's fascinating for all of us. There's several groups that are interested in participating in that, and the ceremony to actually hand it over went, went around, or it's going around the world, is it today? It was yesterday. It was yesterday. It was yesterday. It went around the world from Tokyo to Geneva over to Chicago. All of these partners have been working on put, making this. Everyone wants to participate. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, we don't know yet where it's going to be, but we know how to build it, essentially. We have the blueprint. Okay, so now we're going to get back to talent. And, of course, the first thing we do on our show when we talk about something is ask a trivia question. And sometimes it can take people out there who are watching this as much as 10, 15 seconds to figure out the answer. But this one's a little bit challenging. The question is, talent stands for something. It's an acronym. What does the acronym talent, T-A-L-E-N-T, stand for, and as extra credit, I, my challenge is, do you understand the pattern of the letters that were chosen for the acronym? Do you understand it? That's the second part of the question. Okay, so that's our trivial question. We have with us someone, a new face, Marjena. Marjena Lepte is right here next to me. I'm over here too. Let's see. Okay. Uh, and Marjena is going to be looking through the social media. When you ask questions about talent, about CERN, anything at all, um, you, you can tweet it using a hashtag, hashtag AskCERN or hang out with CERN, or you can type your question into the comments section of the area where you're watching this on YouTube or Google, Google Plus where you're, where you're watching uh, this video now. And you can do that afterwards if you're watching me on a recording. That's fine. Type in your questions. We try to answer as many as possible uh, and we will get to them. Marjana, on the other hand, she's here watching to see who's going to be also the first one to answer a trivia question. Okay, and you guys are not allowed to participate, okay? <laughs> Even if you know, I don't know if you know. It's not, so, it's not so easy. Okay, so why don't why don't you? We're going to start here with Mara. Why don't you give us a little rundown? What what is this thing called? Okay, so talent is a Marie Curie network. This mm -hmm. means that um, the funds to create this network, this project, are coming from the European Commission, mm -hmm. and uh, we managed to put together a um, network of research institutions universities and industries and we all work with a common goal and the goal is very well defined you know that at CERN we are now in what we call the long shutdown one where the machine and the detectors are stopped 
and we are improving both the accelerator and the tankers. And we have a very challenging project now in our hands, which is to insert a new layer of pixel detector in the Atlas detector in the innermost region. So it will be the first detector layer closer to the interaction point. We are currently building that detector. And the students, which are up to 15, funded by this network, they all work in the project, but in very different aspects. They work on the sensors that we will put in that detector. They work on the electronics. Some of them, they work on finding new materials, light, cooling systems that will help us to operate that detector in the best conditions. Mm -hmm. And we do this together with industry. So we get them on board already at the beginning, so they help to develop all the solutions we need. Okay. And another part which is very interesting of these 15 students working together is that in addition to this very specific goal, which is building a detector in the next month to be installed in 2014, mm -hmm. in addition, all of them work on a second pure research project Mm -hmm. looking a bit more ahead, looking at the improvements we will do in the five, ten years to come. Uh -huh. So we are mixing something very applied, which has a very uh, defined deadline, with something where your imagination, your creativity could be a bit uh, enlarged, because it's a solution for a bit later in the future. OK, very very good. Um, so, so for those of you who have asked that question, what are you guys doing during these two years that the LHC is down? Are you on vacation? The answer is Never. no. <laughs> no. Uh, my colleagues are working harder than ever because there's a lot of work going on to upgrade the LHC to higher energy. And probably what's more of a challenge is higher luminosity. Luminosity means you have more intensity of the beam. And along with that comes much more radiation. Exactly. Along with the beam. So, so that brings us new challenges. Uh, for the detectors, and the part that's probably challenged the most is whatever's closest to the beam line. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to make that challenge even more difficult by putting something even closer to the beam line. Yes. And and it has to be able to survive that very very harsh environment. And so to find a solution for that, what do you do? You find smart, talented people, exactly. young people who can come up with good solutions. Uh, and so we have with us Rafael, Laura, and Arno. In fact, I should be polite. Give the full names. This is Rafael Tedin or Tedin. How do you pronounce? Tedin. Tedin. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Tedin. Okay. Where are you from, Rafael? Spain. I'm from Spain. From Spain. Okay. And we have uh, Laura Franconi. Yes. Hello. And where, where are you from? Italy. Italy. You can say where. You can tell us your hometown. Uh, Bologna. Bologna, okay. And uh, and we also have Arno Kampacher. Yes, that's right. I'm and from Austria, from Feldkirch. Okay, from Austria. Very good. That's a, that's a good mix, good representation of Europe. And I imagine that uh, in uh, talent, probably in, in your group, you have a big, broad spectrum of people from all around Europe, people working with you. Now, let me ask you this. You just came over a, a little while ago to, to, to work uh, on this project. You got started in the project. But I understand it isn't all happening at CERN. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. For instance, my, I'm, I'm working for a company in, in, in Finland, which is also part of this, of this project. It's called Autostep. OK, so you went from Spain to Finland to work yeah, on a project okay. for CERN. Yeah. OK. And and uh, and let's see here. And so, where did you, Laura? Where did you? Um, where are you working? I'm working in Oslo, in Norway. In so Norway, the far north. Okay, that's smart. In the summer, that's that's a good idea. Get up there, although it's really hard to sleep these days up there. <laughs> and 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 let me ask. So so in Arno, where where are you at? I'm uh, in Germany, in Erfurt. Okay, in at a company. So everybody went to a different place, but right now you guys are at CERN because I understand there is a summer school going on. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So so you've been here for some time. Excuse me. <clears throat> for some time. Yeah, we started last Monday. On the last third, Monday. Uh, third of June. The third of June. And so what have you been doing in the summer school? Well, we have uh, technical training. Uh, we have um, complementary skills training, uh, like communication skills, 
And uh, we also had a business training because one of the work packages in uh, Talent is a business work package, uh, figuring out how uh, the technologies we develop could be used in a context for industry and businesses. Okay, so that, that's very interesting because normally this sort of bridging to the other worlds is done after the fact or, or, or by people separately. You guys have to get this talent, uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use that word, but <laughs> you have to get that, uh, understand these skills from the very beginning and, and it's integrated. You're learning technical communication and business. Now, uh, I understand that as part of learning how to communicate, learning communication, that you're each able to tell us within two minutes, is that right? Three minutes. Oh, <laughs> this is forever. In three minutes, you're able to tell us what it is that you're working on. Is that right? Did you have a competition? Um, it wasn't a competition. It wasn't a competition? Okay. okay. So, should we have one now? <laughs> we, can let, we can let everyone vote if you, if you want. So who wants to start? Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll just do this in order. Raphael, okay? Can, if you can try, try to trim it down. Try to trim it down a little bit. <laughs> and um, Raphael's on five, four, three, two, one, go, Raphael. Okay. Um, as I said, I'm working in Finland at Atostec and also here at CERN, and I'm working on fast software. And well, if you know, if you want to know what is uh, what is fast software, I can give you an analogy. Um, suppose you are going to a supermarket with only one till, and then customers are coming and coming, and there uh, is a huge queue built. And okay, if you only have one cashier, um, he might be not able to actually serve all the customers. So. What we do in a supermarket is you, we have several tills, so in order to, to be able to serve several customers at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we have a similar problem here at CERN that um, we produce a huge amount of data. And for that, for processing those da this data, we have to use computers, we have to use software. And this software has to be very fast. So what we use is parallel software, software that can uh, do several things at the same time, just as serving several customers at the same time. So that's what, what I'm doing, is, um, fast software, developing this fast software. Very good. I hope, I hope your middleware is better than mine and that it can choose the correct queue to go into. Uh, because no, I don't think so. <laughs> no? <laughs> mine always gets it wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Very good. OK, that's understandable. Um, so you're working on software. Uh, yeah. Laura, yeah. tell us what you're working on. Ready? Go. OK. Uh, so I'm working in Oslo, as I said before. And um, my research is related to the integration of the, of the IBL. But in principle, what I wanted to, to, to present, what I did late just earlier today, it was to give an idea of the reason why, actually, the, the IBL will be inserted. So um, let's start from the thinking of the fact that the IBL, the, the sorry, the pixel detector, there is the innermost layer now inside the, the Atlas detector, is kind of a, a really precise camera. And it can detect very, very fast and very, very precisely in the, and very sharply all the particles that are passing through it. Coming from the collision, there is kind of a bunch, and a lot of particle, particles are going out. And at the beginning, when the first uh, the pixel detector was inserted, it was possible for the pixel to actually see all of them. But as making a comparison between the pixel detector and the and a human eye, it's something like at the beginning it was kind of a baby, and it was it was possible it was able actually to see all the different particles and to have these really sharp images. But from time to time, it gets older and older, and the images get more and more blurry. Mm -hmm. The insertion of the IBL is actually kind of putting a pair of glasses on the pixel detector in order to see sharp again. And that was it. This I can relate to. At my age, I can relate to that perfectly. <laughs> I understand. Uh, so OK, we're putting glasses on our detector. It's going to have better, better imaging to see what's going on there. Excellent. Okay, you got you got two tough ones here to beat now. Okay, I know, but it's up to you. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. 
Oh, no. So, so yeah, I'm I'm the guy who develops those pixel detectors. Actually, I'm I'm mostly sitting on my computer and doing layouts of uh, of uh, new uh, detectors. Which means the old ones are are a bit small, and uh, you have to put several detectors um, adjacent to each other so that you can see everything that's coming out. But between those detectors, there are blind spots, and I'm trying to make those detectors bigger and in the long run also more sensitive. Um, but um, the second uh, thing is uh, the, the key issue uh, Laura was uh, telling us is um, they have to be radiation hard. So what she described as blurring, um, I'm trying to counteract that with uh, inserting oxygen into the silicon uh, crystal so that the detector uh, can heal itself after being exposed to high doses of radiation. And I'm also, uh, after everything is done and after everything is produced, um, in my uh, well, in the company I'm working at in Germany, um, I'm also testing them, doing some uh, measurements of uh, current voltage curves and uh, characterizing those new detectors. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, I get this very well. They are good. Huh? Yeah, they are good. I see why. <laughs> I see why you took them. So, so, um, boy, I have lots of questions. Um, let me. I, I should check. Do we have anything yet from social media that we want to ask? No, everybody's trying look to over there. find out what talent means. <laughs> Everyone's still working on it. Oh, we no, got we him this time. Okay. Oh, you think you have? Okay, Achintia gets all the credit. Our director, Achintia, is the one who came up with this, this trivia question. So my questions are always answered within 10 seconds. <laughs> he did a good job. So, so uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about the physics here, if we can. It, uh, it's, it's fascinating. Um, you're, you're adding a layer. How many layers are already in uh, the, in, in the, the tracking inside there? Pixel detector is made of three layers. And the IBL, the insertable B layer, will be the fourth one in the innermost part. So like closer to the beam line and closer to the interaction point, as Matt was explaining. OK, so, so tell me now, you're adding a fourth layer. Now, I know that you, you use layers, typically you want to measure different points on a, on a track as it comes through. And you want to measure the curvature of a track because that tells you how fast it's going, what its momentum is as it comes out. Now normally three points should be enough to give me the curvature. What am I going to gain when I get a fourth point on this? Um, there are two things. First of all, as I tried to explain before, the pixel detector is somehow sometimes a bit failing mm -hmm. uh, because it got a lot of radiation damage that was caused by a lot of this, this particle that came out of the interaction. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, the, I, the B inside the IBL word stands for B bottom fork, mm -hmm. which is a, a long living particle that actually decays after a short path. And we can actually measure uh, the distance between the first, the primary, what we call the primary vertex, that is actually when the, where the interaction took place, mm -hmm. and where the B decay, the B top, sorry, decayed. So it's kind of, it transformed in something different, but it traveled a bit before, before actually um, decaying so in other particles. So you get, you'll get more precision for that, that measurement. Exactly. And also, in case there's a part of the detector that's out, one of the other layers is out, you'll still have three. Exactly. Okay, so that ensures that, that you're always going to have a good measurement inside there. And you're going to look at B quarks. I thought they were beauty. I've heard them called beauty, the beauty or, or, or bottom. Uh, now, B quarks are, are very interesting. We, we make lots of them, right? If I understood right, the, the, the Higgs... It's the most favorite thing to decay to was the B. Yeah, we couldn't detect it with the B, which is an interesting thing. But it's because there's so much background, so many B quarks. But there's other kinds of physics you can do with B quarks. Do you have any examples of, of physics that, that you do that makes you want to, to tag these B quarks? Um, yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, for example, the B quark is a decay product of the top quark, okay. which, is, uh, which is the heaviest particle at the moment that we, like, phys physicists have discovered um, in, uh, in the, inside this model 
which describe all the particles and all the interactions that is called the standard model. And the top fork is, I mean, is um, it can be actually a starting point for new physics. So for example, it can either be a decay product of uh, supersymmetric particles that, as far as understood, uh, will, will be the topic of next week's uh, Google Hangout. Mm -hmm. Or it can be the um, and the decay or the production mechanism for, for all the new particles that we still haven't detected. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very good, very good. So let me ask you a little bit more about, about this program, because I think I find it very interesting that you guys got into this, the Marie Curie program. Uh, you know, what, what, got you, what got you interested in it? Maybe we can do each of you. Raphael, maybe what, what, what prompted you to want to apply to this program? And uh, what do you intend to do uh, with, with your career? So I didn't get the first question. Well, the first one is, is what, what, what brought your attention to this program and made you want to apply to it? Why did I apply to, to the project? To the project? Yeah. yeah, I found, uh, I found it was a really great opportunity to, to get to, to Finland and to, to, to CERN, obviously. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working now in a, in a consulting company, a software consulting company. And previously, I was working at a university, so I wanted to see how how is to work in the industry, but I still wanted to to have something to do with science. So I think this is perfect uh, perfect match. So you envision after you you completed, will you do more studies, or do you intend to go into the industry? I I think I will continue to the to the industry, but I'm now doing my my PhD, so I have both ways. So let's see. Okay, okay. And, and, and you, Laura? Um, I decided to apply for it and luckily I got accepted because I was really, I mean, I already knew actually the CERN environment and I really loved the, this international scientific uh, place where there are a lot of things going on and I really, of course, like particle physics. Uh -huh. And it was a good opportunity also to discover something new about going to move into another uh, country, which is one of the um, constraints, let's say, for, for applying because you cannot stay in your own country, and uh -huh. is something that I've usually, I mean, I always like uh, having this mixture of cultural cultures and uh, try to, to, to see what, what it means living in another country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you, Arno, tell us. Well, I usually, uh, originally, my, my field of study was material science, and I wanted to do something new. Um, and uh, it's quite complicated because um, I applied in Liverpool, at the University of Liverpool. Um, they didn't take me, but I looked up what uh, programs they have. And there was a company in Austria I wanted to apply to, and they told me, no, I'm sorry, uh, last week was uh, the last one we, we employed. But I know someone in, in Erfurt, maybe you can apply there. Uh, I did that, and luckily they uh, accepted me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think now I, I'm going to head on over to Marzina and find out what kind of questions we're getting from social media. Harder questions than I'm giving you, I'm sure. <laughs> so we have uh, one question from YouTube, uh, or even two questions from YouTube, mm -hmm. from uh, D2. 214. What kind of radiation are we working with here? Alpha, gamma. Oh, okay. Who'd like to Who'd like to uh, answer that? Well, basically, basically, um, basically all of it actually, because we have we have um, normal <laughs> normal uh, gamma radiation, of course, but we also have uh, particle radiation in that sense, because uh, the we are colliding protons. And uh, out of that, there is not only, of course, uh, gamma radiation, but also just um, particle, real particles. Because gamma radiation is uh, is photons, so that's uh, they have no mass. Uh, so um, um, yeah, actually, yeah, the answer is all of it, actually. <laughs> okay. Okay. What? Where is there any? Um, how could we compare this? What are the kind of levels of radiation you have there? I mean, would, would you? Um, would, it, would you want to be down there next to the beam? When, when the beam flies? <laughs> no, definitely not. It's, uh -huh. uh, it's quite high. But uh, I have to say it's, it's uh, perfectly safe because uh, the cavern is way, way uh, under, uh, under some soil. And, um, and um, yeah, so 
<laughs> that's not a problem for anyone living around you. But there are very strict security measures in place to prevent anyone of going down there when the beam is active because it is dangerous. Yeah, very good. OK. Um, Another question? Yes, another question from Marjan. From uh, a question from YouTube from Dave Dowling. Do detectors work by detecting photons or electrons or nuclei or all of those? OK, uh, detectors usually, um, OK, the pixel detector usually manages all the particles does only manages all the charged particles, which correspond to electrons, muons, protons, um, hadrons. They are actually coming out from the hadronization. It's called so when a part, for example, when a bottom fork, as I said before, decays, is actually it gives. Oh, I'm getting crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's something difficult to explain in simple words. So. Um, so all the charged particles are actually detected by the pixel detector. And going from the innermost layer out uh, to the outer outermost part of, uh, of Atlas, you can detect different, there are different layers of detector who are able to detect different particles. So for example, photons will be, as are neutral, will be not detected in the pixel detector, but will be stopped in the what's called the electron magnetic calorimeter. Mm -hmm. And muons, for example, will pass through all through the detector up to the what's called the muon system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, now they, when they, the particles, when a charged particle passes through, it's passing through some material there in this pixel detector, mm -hmm. and that's that's silicon. Is that correct? Yes. So yeah. it passes through silicon, and then it 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 does a ionization. Yes. It, it, it does ionization. I'm sure you will find. You find a charge that ends up on electronics. Mm -hmm. Is that exactly. more or less right? I'm, exactly. I'm from the muon system myself, and, and it's very similar. And I think the right. question is very good because one of the biggest challenges when you design one of these very large particle detectors is to select the right technologies and put all these technologies together to see all the particles you can imagine that will cross your detector. Mm -hmm. And that is why we break it down in layers, and the first layer will detect charged particles, the second mm -hmm. layer the neutral, and up to the end where only the muons go through. Mm -hmm. So if, the, if we talk of the IBL, which is where talent project evolves around, or if we talk of Atlas, the answer is different. The IBL sees a defined type of particle, but Atlas is designed to see, to detect all type of particles producing the collisions. Right. And it, and it even detects those particles you can't detect. Exactly. Right? <laughs> okay. It detects them, neutrinos as an example, mm -hmm. because we build the detector completely hermetically around the collision point, and we can see when there's an imbalance of energy. And that's when we know we've seen neutrinos. So we measure all of these particles. Marjana, give us another question. So uh, Dave Dolin mm -hmm. would like to know, is, uh, is some radiation worse than other types? Some radiation worse than other types? Yes. A lot of questions. Yes and no. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's always the thing with, with uh, dose, you know? Uh, Light doses of, uh, for example, gamma radiation aren't really harmful. It's in all of us, like C14, and it provides the mechanism for evolution, basically. Uh, at high doses, of course, they're dangerous. Uh, your sound, your sound just went away. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, now uh, you're back. You're back. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, basically, alpha radiation, by by some definitions, is actually the most dangerous, but the thing is, it only it, it's even blocked by a sheet of paper. So if you don't uh, digest some uh, radioactive source that emits alpha particles, um, you're not going to have a problem. So uh, in, in reality, what's more dangerous, I'd say, is gamma radiation because it penetrates. But basically, from the physics standpoint, alpha radiation is way more uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very interesting, and that echoes something we learned just a couple weeks ago when we talked to our colleagues from ISOLD, mm -hmm. because they were working on uh, the very rarest isotope, and, and they were very much interested in producing that, because it could be, it only emits 
alpha radiation, meaning that it, it only goes travels a very short distance inside the human body, meaning that if you could target it exactly on cancerous cells, you could only affect those cells, not other cells. And, and I, I, it's also very interesting to hear what you said about alpha radiation. Uh, that's something uh, a lot of people might not realize, but the radi there is natural radiation. When you have a Geiger counter, you hear it. There's natural radiation out there. And and that's how we've evolved. That's how we've, we've developed, because we do uh, get affected by that radiation. It can slightly modify our DNA, and that allows us to be different and, and for our species to, to evolve. Uh, but as everyone knows, if you have a high level of that, it's also dangerous and, and, and it can harm you. Uh, do we have another question from Maria? Yes, we have a question uh, from YouTube, from uh, Banana Savi. Mm -hmm. uh, are there opportunities for uh, current physics students to work with talent? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I can answer that one. Okay. Um, talent is a project that, in fact, we started uh, one year ago, I mean, in 2012. And Talent can fund 15 students at the doctoral level, to do PhDs, and two students which are a bit more experienced, so I would say in the postdoc level. And currently, we have hired everyone but one. So we have 14 doctoral students and two postdoctoral students already working within Talent. So there is one position that will be open very soon, mm -hmm. and this will be the last one. Okay. Having said that, talent is not the only one, the only Marie Curie network at CERN. There mm -hmm. are many others, and I encourage you to go to the job page of CERN, where you will have a list of all the opportunities in other Marie Curie networks, which are really very many. Very good. That's easy to find. You go to CERN.ch, and you can find jobs somewhere there. It's not hard to find on the, on the page. Jobs, anyway. All you can do is slash jobs and, and you'll, you will find out about that. So you should consider that if you like doing physics uh, and if you have talent. Exactly. <laughs> this is the, the big advantage of these Marie Curie networks, that you get a very strong technical education combined, as the students we are hearing today, mm -hmm. with these communication skills, business opportunities, and that is very luxurious, I find, in our field. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very, very good. Okay, so there you know how to get involved. Uh, are there any other comments, uh, words of advice that, that Rafael, Laura, and Arno would like to give to, to anybody applying? Or is it a good idea? Should they give it up? Forget about it? What do you think? No, it's a great idea. I mean, it's a great opportunity also because we are getting along together. We are forming this close group of friends all, and colleagues, but at the same time, we're also friends, and I think it will be a lot of fun for the next two years and a half. Yeah, and also, I mean, uh, we were talking about um, uh, if, if, he, if someone can join Talent uh, who is a student right now. Um, I guess that's quite difficult, but still, um, every summer, CERN organizes a summer school for students, and not only for, for actual physics students, but also for, for um, people still in school. So that's, that's really cool, and you can, can apply to that if you're interested uh, in physics and be at the forefront of uh, scientific expression. Very well put, Arno. Thank you. Uh, you might have a job in our communication group soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's, it's very important. No, actually, students are just coming here. Uh, I actually help to coordinate a, a group of students from the US. We have about 13 students. They're undergraduate students. So these are students that are in their third year of, of school, typically, or between their third and fourth year. Uh, but there's many different programs, so it's worthwhile to go to the to the CERN web pages and look for that if you're interested to come here uh, to, to, to do uh, work and to, to, to learn things. I think uh, that, well, actually, I know, before we go, I want to get to trivia. And, and I'm getting kicked under the table here by our producer, Kate, that we're going to go to trivia. But I, I do still have still have a, a question, just to understand, where are Raphael, Laura, and Arno going to go? How often are they going to come back to CERN? Are they going to be at CERN for a while? Yes. What's the future for them? Well, th there are several opportunities. The first one is that uh, every Marie Curie fellow has the opportunity to have a, what they call secondments, which means that within the three years of the contract, you can have about three months per year where you go somewhere else, mm -hmm. within the network or outside the network. And okay. you can do in that somewhere else place 
a different type of education or uh, some technical specialization. So many of our Marie Curie, uh, Marie Curie students in Tallinn obviously will come to CERN because there is a very clear milestone which is to build this insertable village of detector. Right. Right. But the ones that are already at CERN, they will go outside CERN. Okay. So that is a great opportunity. But uh, one of the good things of the network is that the students work in their institutions and then we have special events like annual meetings, review meetings, project meetings, summer schools, where mm -hmm. they all get together mm -hmm. at CERN. Okay, okay. So now, now we know what you guys are going to be doing the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. Now we've come to that time. The trivia question answer. I hope everyone's put in their, their answers. Do we have a winner, Marjana? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Who's our winner? We have a winner from YouTube who responded to your trivia question at 5.13. It's Timothy Powell who said, should mm -hmm. I give the answer? Or you yeah. Want to yeah. Okay. yeah, we'll put it up later. Type, type written. Oh, it's up. Okay. Uh, okay, <laughs> so top uh, talent is a training for career development in high radiation and environment technologies. It's the worst acronym ever. <laughs> you get, now, 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 you get the my second half of that. My, yes, but there was another half. Yeah. And I don't think we have a, a person who knows. Mm -hmm. this. Okay. Now, I carefully worded my second half there, and my wording was, "And do you understand the pattern of the letters chosen for the acronym?" And there is only one correct answer to that, and that's no. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> understands the pattern of the letters chosen for the acronym. It just spelled Helen. So you could have just said no, and you would have gone, sorry, no extra credit there. But thank you for participating. <laughs> okay, any last words, Mar? Anything that you'd like no, to add to No, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, we, we encourage all the students to really have a look to these opportunities in, in the job pages uh, of, of CERN because it's, uh, it's really a fantastic program to get into this, and not only for physicists. In the case of talent, we have engineers, physicists, people that work on the software part. Mm -hmm. So there is a place for many fields within talent and within CERN. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so I want to thank you guys uh, for joining us. Uh, Rafael, uh, Arno, thank you very much for joining us. You did an excellent job. This was also, by the way, you didn't know about it, but this is part of your communication training. <laughs> okay. yeah. So you guys, you guys all passed. You did a great job. Yes. We appreciate you coming on. We hope you have a great time in the program. You learn a whole lot. And I know that you're going to help us a great deal here at CERN. Okay, so I'm going to plug some things. I'm going to shamelessly plug some things, which I, which I think are a lot of fun. Uh, first of all, you see a Lego model. If you would like to be able to go to the Lego store, to the toy store, and buy a Lego a little kit there that lets you build the Atlas detector, you will be able to. But first, you have to vote. So we only need about 9,000 more. Uh, votes. We're getting there. We're getting. There. We actually we just put this up there. Uh, Sasha Meles is a brilliant, brilliant postdoc working for us uh, on Atlas. He's he's up in in Copenhagen, and he built an enormous 9,000 piece model. Uh, this is going to be a smaller model. Something that takes him, the expert, about two days to construct. Uh, but the smaller model is something that you could construct. You or I could construct in a day or two. Uh, my children could do it in probably about half an hour. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a good size uh, good size model. We'd really like to get this out there so people can build a detector. Uh, so go to the Atlas uh, blog. It's very simple. You can just go to atlas.ch/blog. Uh, you don't even need the ending there, and that will take you. It's, it's the last blog that's up there, uh, and that will show you how you can vote uh, for this to be one of the models that they choose to put into a kit. Okay, so shameless plug number one. Uh, other shameless plugs. Um, open days. We're always going to push that. Open days. You got to make your plans if you can possibly get over to CERN. We're expecting a huge number of people to come here, uh, but we want you to come as well. Fair and open days will be the 28th and 29th of September. 
both of those days, Saturday and a Sunday, and it's going to be sunny and beautiful weather. Mm -hmm. It's just already set. We've, we've, we've set that up. Uh, and uh, and also, I will shamelessly plug that we will be at the Montreux Jazz Festival uh, the 17th and 18th of July. I added the 17th because I just found out that Bill Fontana, uh, who's our artist in residence here at CERN, he will be talking on the 17th about sound sculptures. Okay, so I think that's a really cool thing. We have artists in residence here at, at, at CERN, and he will be talking there. And on the 18th, we'll have some physicists and various people talking about physics of music and the music of physics, and we'll even have a couple performances. And so if you're in the area and you can out to the Montreux Jazz Festival, 17th of 18th, so I come to that. Anything else you guys want to plug? Next week's show. You guys are so – I don't want to plug this because I can't make it. Uh, next week's show is going to be awesome. We're going to learn all about Susie. We're desperately seeking Susie. Uh, it's going to feature our one and only John Ellis, our, our, our greatest theorist, our most, most famous theorist, I'd say, uh, these days on CERN, because he's all over um, social media, on the media. You see a lot about him. John, John is, is a great person. He's going to explain uh, Susie for us in five words or less, right? Something like that. We're going to challenge him to do as well as the students did today. So that will be next week. I'm not sure. Do we know who our host is going to be? Who's going to replace for me? Possibly Seth, possibly Freya, possibly both. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe Seth, right? They're great. They're great. They can actually finish sentences, unlike me. Uh, so, so I will try to sneak in. I have a, we have a collaboration week next week, an Atlas week. We have these three times a year, and I have to give a talk right at that time. Uh, but otherwise, I will try to peek in and see what you guys are doing and ask some questions. So uh, thank you, everybody, again, for joining us uh, on Hangout with Sam. We look forward to seeing you next week. And be sure to ask your questions. If you haven't asked them during the show and if we didn't get to them, ask your questions in the comments section. So thank you again, everybody. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.